Hi, I'm Carrie Ann, and welcome to Crash Course Computer Science. Last episode, we discussed how writing programs in native machine code and having to contend with so many low level details was a huge impediment to writing complex programs. To abstract away many of these low level details, programming languages were developed that let programmers concentrate on solving a problem with computation and less on nitty gritty hardware details. So today, we're going to continue that discussion and introduce some fundamental building blocks that almost all programming languages provide. <laughs> Just like spoken languages, programming languages have statements. These are individual complete thoughts like I want tea or it is raining. By using different words, we can change the meaning. For example, I want tea to I want unicorns. But we can't change I want tea to I want raining. That doesn't make grammatical sense. The set of rules that govern the structure and composition of statements in a language is called syntax. The English language has syntax and so do all programming languages. A equals five is a programming language statement. In this case, the statement says a variable named A has the number five stored in it. This is called an assignment statement because we're assigning a value to a variable. To express more complex things, we need a series of statements like like A is 5, B is 10, C equals A plus B. This program tells the computer to set variable A equal to 5, variable B to 10, and finally to add A and B together, and put that result, which is 15, into, you guessed it, variable C. Note that we can call variables whatever we want. Instead of A, B, and C, it could be apples, pears, and fruits. The computer doesn't care as long as the variables are uniquely named, but it's probably best practice to name them things that make sense in case someone else is trying to understand your code. A program, which is a list of instructions, is a bit like a recipe. Boil water, add noodles, wait 10 minutes, drain and enjoy. In the same way, the program starts at the first statement and runs down one at a time until it hits the end. So far, we've added two numbers together. Boring. Let's make a video game instead. Of course, it's way too early to think about coding the entire game. So instead, we'll use our example to write little snippets of code that cover some programming fundamentals. Imagine we're building an old school arcade game where Grace Hopper has to capture bugs before they get into the Harvard Mark I and crash the computer. On every level, the number of bugs increases. Grace has to catch them before they wear out any relays in the machine. Fortunately, she has a few extra relays for repairs. To get started, we'll need to keep track of a bunch of values that are important for gameplay, like what level the player is on, the score, the number of bugs remaining, as well as the number of spare relays in Grace's inventory. So we must initialize our variables. That is, set their initial value. Level equals one, score equals zero, bugs equals five, spare relays equals four, and player name equals Andre. To create an interactive game, we need to control the flow of the program beyond just running from top to bottom. To do this, we use control flow statements. There are several times, but if statements are the most common. You can think of them as if X is true, then do Y. An English language example is, if I am tired, then get T. So if I am tired is a true statement, then I will go get T. If I am tired is false, then I will not go get tea. An if statement is like a fork in the road. Which path you take is conditional on whether the expression is true or false. So these expressions are called conditional statements. In most programming languages, an if statement looks something like if expression, then some code, then end the if statement. For example, if level is one, then we set the score to zero because the player is just starting. We also set the number of bugs to one to keep it easy for now. Notice the lines of code that are conditional on the if statement are nested between the if and end if. Of course, we can change the conditional expression to whatever we want to test, like is score greater than 10 or is bugs less than one? And if statements can be combined with an else statement, which acts as a catch-all if the expression is false. If the level is not one, the code inside the else block will be executed instead, and the number of bugs that Grace has to battle is set to three times the level number. So on level two, it would be six bugs, and on level three, there's nine and so on. Score isn't modified in the else block, so Grace gets to keep any points earned. Here are some examples of if-then-else statements from some popular programming languages. You can see the syntax varies a little, but the underlying structure is roughly the same. If statements are executed once, a conditional path is chosen and the program moves on. To repeat some statements many times, we need to create a conditional loop. One way is a while statement, also called a while loop. As you might have guessed, this loops a piece of code while a condition is true. Regardless of the programming language, they look something like this. In our game, let's say at certain points, a friendly colleague restocks Grace with relays. Hooray! To animate him replenishing our stock back up to a maximum of four, we can use a while loop. Let's walk through this code. First, we'll assume that Grace only has one tube left when her colleague enters. When we enter the while loop, the first thing the computer does is test its conditional. Is relays less than four? Well, relays is currently one, so yes. Now we enter the loop. Then we hit the line of code relays equals relays plus one. 
This is a bit confusing because the variable is using itself as an assignment statement. So let's unpack it. You always start by figuring out the right side of the equal sign first. So what does relays plus one come out to be? Well, relays is currently the value one. So one plus one equals two. Then this result gets saved back into the variable relays, writing over the old value. So now relays stores the value two. We've hit the end of the while loop, which jumps the program back up. Just as before, we test the conditional to see if we're going to enter the loop. Is relays less than four? Well, yes, relays now equals two. So we enter the loop again. Two plus one equals three. So three is saved into relays. Loop again. Is three less than four? Yes, it is. Into the loop again. Three plus one equals four. So we save four into relays. Loop again. Is four less than four? No. So the condition is now false, and thus we exit the loop and move on to any remaining code. That's how a while loop works. There's also the common for loop. Instead of being a condition controlled loop that can repeat forever until the condition is false, a for loop is count controlled. It repeats a specific number of times. They look something like this. Now let's put in some real values. This example loops 10 times because we specified that variable i starts at the value one and goes up to 10. The unique thing about a for loop is that each time it hits next, it adds one to i. When i equals 10, the computer knows it's been looped 10 times and the loop exits. We can set the number to whatever we want, 10, 42, or a billion. It's up to us. Let's say we want to give the player a bonus at the end of each level for the number of vacuum relays they have left over. As the game gets harder, it takes more skill to have unused relays. So we want the bonus to go up exponentially based on the level. We need to write a piece of code that calculates exponents. That is multiplying a number by itself a specific number of times. A loop is perfect for this. First, let's initialize a new variable called bonus and set it to one. Then we create a for loop starting at one and looping up to the level number. Inside that loop, we multiply bonus times the number of relays and save that new value back into bonus. For example, let's say relays equals two and level equals three. So the for loop will loop three times, which means bonus is going to get multiplied by relays, by relays, by relays, or in this case, times two, times two, times two, which is a bonus of eight. That's two to the third power. This exponent code is useful and we might want to use it in other parts of our code. It'd be annoying to copy and paste this everywhere and have to update the variable names each time. Also, if we found a bug, we'd have to hunt around and update every place we used it. It also makes code more confusing to look at. Less is more. What we want is a way to package up our exponent code so that we can use it, get the result and not have to see the internal complexity. We're once again moving up a new level of abstraction. To compartmentalize and hide complexity, programming languages can package pieces of code into named functions, also called methods or subroutines in different programming languages. These functions can then be used by any other part of that program just by calling its name. Let's turn our exponent code into a function. First, we should name it. We can call it anything we want, like happy unicorn. But since our code calculates exponents, let's call it exponent. Also, instead of using specific variable names like relays and levels, we specify generic variable names like base and exp, whose initial values are going to be passed into our function from some other part of the program. The rest of our code is the same as before, now tucked into our function and with new variable names. Finally, we need to send the result of our exponent code back to the part of the program that requested it. For this, we use a return statement and specify that the value in result be returned. So our full function code looks like this. Now we can use this function anywhere in our program simply by calling its name and passing in two numbers. For example, if we want to calculate two to the 44th power, we can just call exponent two comma 44. And like 18 trillion comes back. Behind the scenes, two and 44 get saved into variables base and exp inside the function. It does all of its loops as necessary and then the function returns with the result. Let's use our newly minted function to calculate a score bonus. First, we initialize bonus to zero. Then we check if the player has any remaining relays with an if statement. If they do, we call our exponent function passing in relays and level, which calculates relays to the power of level and returns the result which we save into bonus. This bonus calculating code might be useful later. So let's wrap it up as a function too. Yes, a function that calls a function. And then, wait for it, we can use this function in an even more complex function. Let's write one that gets called every time the player finishes a level. We'll call it level finished. It needs to know the number of relays left, what level it was, and the current score. Those values have to get passed in. Inside our function, we'll calculate the bonus using our calc bonus function and add that to the running score. 
Also, if the current score is higher than the game's high score, we save the new high score and the player's name. Finally, we return the current score. Now we're getting pretty fancy. Functions are calling functions are calling functions. When we call a single line of code like this, the complexity is hidden. We don't see all of the internal loops and variables, we just see the result come back as if by magic. A total score of 53. But it's not magic, it's the power of abstraction. If you understand this example, then you understand the power of functions and the entire essence of modern programming. It's not feasible to write, for example, a web browser as one gigantically long list of statements. It would be millions of lines long and impossible to comprehend. So instead, software consists of thousands of smaller functions, each responsible for different features. In modern programming, it's uncommon to see functions longer than around 100 lines of code, because by then, there's probably something that should be pulled out and made into its own function. Modularizing programs into functions not only allows a single programmer to write an entire app, but also allows teams of people to work efficiently on even bigger programs. Different programmers can work on different functions, and if everyone makes sure their code works correctly, then when everything is put together, the whole program should work too. And in the real world, programmers aren't wasting time writing things like exponents. Modern programming languages come with huge bundles of pre-written functions called libraries. These are written by expert coders, made efficient and rigorously tested, and then given to everyone. There are libraries for almost everything, including networking, graphics, and sound. Topics we'll discuss in future episodes. But before we get to those, we need to talk about algorithms. Intrigued? You should be. I'll see you next week. Crash Course Computer Science is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. At their channel, you can check out a playlist of shows like Physics Girl, Deep Look, and PBS Space Time. This episode was filmed at the Chad and Stacey Emigold Studio in Indianapolis, Indiana, and it was made with the help of all these nice people and our wonderful graphics team, Thought Cafe. That's where we're going to have to halt and catch fire. See you next week.